Hey, hey, hello, leavers, believers, Triple J hack obsessives. Welcome to an episode of Leaving Hill Song that we're calling The Life That I Didn't Even Know I Would Get to Have But Felt So Right. My name's Tanya, and that sounds like a indie song. Triple J is a radio station that presents alternative and new music and has done for a bunch of decades in Australia. And our guest today, Tom Tilly, is a well-known journalist from Australia's ABC and is now an author. He's well known as a longtime host of Triple J's Hack program and he now hosts The Briefing, which is a daily news podcast and is a regular on Channel 9. Recently, Tom wrote a book about growing up in the revival centres, the Christian revival centres in Australia, and what exactly a unique experience that was for him. And it's called Speaking in Tongues. And Tom joined me and Fiona from last season's episode, A Pentecostal Agenda, to discuss what it's been like since he wrote that book. We also talked about what impacts it's had on his relationships, his family, and how he sees the world and his future as a father. So pull up a chair and thanks for joining us for The Life I Didn't Even Know I Would Get to Have But Felt So Right with Tom Tilly and Fiona. So thank you so much, Tom, for joining us today and taking the time to be with us. Everybody's been really looking forward to it. We're really excited about it. Thank you. We've chatted a little bit about it, how I think the thing that really struck me was you've had a a background similar to a lot of us and watching interviews with you, like people that didn't know you were kind of like looking around you sort of thing. It was like they're at the museum or something and that's how it struck me. And even watching an interview with a colleague of yours, he was still like, oh, how come I didn't know this stuff about you? Mm. I guess the difference is here is we already get it. Like we mm. we know there's nothing, there's nothing kind of, that's our normal. People call them deliverance meetings. I thought it was Sundays or something. So like that's fine. Yeah, sweet. Yeah, well, I, I thankfully don't have to explain to you guys what speaking in tongues means. <laughs> <laughs> I think, you know, tens of thousands of Australians more know what that is now thanks to the amount of times I've explained it in my media interviews for the book. So Mm. I'm doing my bit for the movement, but I am obviously critiquing it fairly heavily, the Pentecostal movement that is, and particularly the the revival centres which I grew up in. You know, I I go right into the cultural and also the actually the theological problems with that that particular Mm -hmm. group that I was a part of and the cost that that came at for me, but also the amazing life that's, um, come since and 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 the amazing times inside it as well mm. so yeah basically born into the revival center in the Dubbo branch it was a really vibrant branch that my parents had joined at the age of 25 for my mom 29 for my dad they met and married they met it they met at a Dubbo revival center function dad was from Adelaide so he went to a, a really big branch of revival center in a big old picture theater called the Vogue in Adelaide which was sort of well known within that small little circle so cool i just love the history of this yeah 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 so the vogue that's where my dad received the holy spirit speaking in tongues my mum came to the lord as the saying goes in dubbo they met at a at a some kind of church activity where dad was traveling through visiting you know all of his newfound brothers and sisters that that were now suddenly in his life thanks to this new church that he joined and they raised myself and eventually three other brothers so four boys mm-hmm. that, for the first seven years of my life in, in Dubbo, then dad dad got the nod to become the pastor of a new branch in Mudgee. So then we went to Mudgee and I spent my whole teenage years growing up in Mudgee. And on one hand, having a very, very normal country community life, really involved in, in everything I could get into, you know, particularly sports and any any fun stuff that was going on in that town. I was a part of it, except for drinking, partying and hooking up with the hot girls at school. Mostly for my teenage years, I found a, a sense of harmony between my two worlds. There were some things that were hard. There were a lot of things I was really embarrassed about, but my church life in Mudgee remained relatively private. And so 
I found a way to to be honest about my beliefs to my friends at school, but not not to sort of let them in or too many of them in too deep that um, I felt really embarrassed about it. But through writing the book, I realized that there was always a subliminal fear that I would be called out for being a weirdo. Yep, yeah. But it, yeah, it is strange. Yeah, I mean, it's a it is such an unusual culture. We're so used to it, but it's yeah, that's right. It's so unusual, and then. Yeah, you know, I call it like the Taylor Swift song. Called, you know, the moment you knew you had your turning moment of like, no, oh, can't do this anymore. Mm. Everybody seems to come to some point or another. So yeah, it's like all these different processes that seem to go on before and after and that's right. And stuff. Yeah, and yeah, well, that's and you know, I sort of clarified a lot of it through through writing. The book and I'm sure you did too Tanya I'm actually halfway through your book at the moment okay. I've just gotten, just gotten past the bit where Brian Houston sort of skims over the the reality of what what his father's really done in that announcement at church um <clears throat> so look I've learned a lot of a lot more about the broader movement as well through this journey um but yeah my my moment of realization probably one of the, the first well, the first one was 10 years old when I had supposedly received the Holy Spirit, but I got to my first prayer meeting and was very underwhelmed by my the sound of my brothers speaking in tongues and then extremely underwhelmed with my own. Mm-hmm. And that was the first moment where I just thought, maybe, well, firstly, maybe I don't have it. Maybe I've been kidding myself. And then I quickly thought, maybe we're all kidding ourselves. And then I tried to bury that thought, but that those doubts stay stayed with me forever but I was you know obviously that's not something you can say as a 10 year old boy in a church like the revival yeah. sense did you did you ever hear the one where they say like I had a friend who was Czechoslovakian or you know some nationality and they went to some other country and they heard their language being spoken purely in the church oh, they like what yeah there was always the oh yeah, maybe this is something that might be spoken somewhere else and maybe like a third, third, fourth hand version of what you're talking about. I'll mm. tell you what, mm. tell you what I find interesting about that is that, you know, what, what you're talking about there is xenolalia, um, which I've learned about, as opposed to glossolalia. Okay. So xenolalia is when when you speak out a language that is spoken somewhere else, and glossolalia is a language that's just between you and God. And so on in Acts Acts two thirty eight, the day of Pentecost, when when those people came from those other areas and understood the languages that were being spoken, that was Xenolalia. Whereas what what often happens in Pentecostal churches, including my own, was Glossolalia, where it was an unintelligible yeah, language. Yeah, well, that, I never understood that how you'd went from like ba 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 to kind of speaking fluent Russian in you know some. Oh yeah, and they never yeah. explained why what happened on that day of Pentecost was different to what we're all doing in the Pentecostal movement. You know, mm. that's, a, that's a glaring question mark about the practice of speaking in tongues that I've never heard really properly explained. Well, Google Translate can do all that now, so we don't really, <laughs> don't really need it. Yeah. When I left Mudgee and I moved to Sydney to go to uni and I became part of a bigger, a bigger assembly, the Sydney Assembly, and had my first um, proper relationship with a girl in the church, that's when it started to fall apart because my dad, even though he was a pastor, was quite a liberal one. Mm-hmm. But when I went to Sydney, I was under the the control of a stricter pastor and you're part of a bigger assembly. So there's more transparency on on your actions and and the way you're living your life. And that's where it started to unravel. And, and I had another big light bulb movement when I went traveling for the first time in Barcelona mm-hmm. and saw other ways of living, saw that people that were supposedly bad people, like people that loved you know, going partying or or even people that would take drugs or people that had had mm. sex outside of marriage or even children outside of marriage could still be beautiful, loving, generous, passionate people. And it started to unravel there. Also, without the, the normal social structures around me, the weekly, mm-hmm. Mm-hmm. The weekly um, rotation of meetings and all, the, all those people around me, that's, yeah, it, it quickly started to fall apart. Hi, Tom. I'm uh, Fiona. I I have to confess, I grew up in the revival centres as well. Yeah, interesting. Yeah, so am I the first ex-revivalist that's that's had a chat to you, or? <laughs> well, I think uh, Troy. Ah, um, oh, Troy, of course. I've spoken on his podcast, so I believe he spent some years in the revival centre too. Yes, he certainly did. Um, I've spoken on that podcast as well, but 
we're it's, getting it's, a little bit close now. Sure yeah, so we, I mean, we can talk very specifically about the intricacies of the group, but I read your book about two or three months ago. In fact, I, I reckon I had, I'm not exaggerating, about 20 people contact me when your book came out and said, have you read this book? And I'm like, well, that's that's where I grew up too. So <laughs> it kind of gave other people in my life insight into you know where I'd come from in a deeper way as well and I think that's the real importance of us all sharing our stories and getting our stories out there and it's it's great that the broader Australian society is even sort of starting to understand what's going on in these groups and perhaps some of the trauma that people have experienced so thank you for sharing your story I know it validates you know it validated my experience a lot um, and I know it did that for other people as well. Mm -hmm. All of us, um, and, and that's the same. People are loving this book. As we discussed, you've gone on the record. You've put your name to that. And, you know, for lots of reasons, people don't want to. Mm. So, yeah, hats off to you. Thanks, Thank God. you for doing it. Thank yeah. you. Because, you know, they're, 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 the people that listen to podcasts like this, they're, people are listening and they're not really wanting to speak out straight away. They have a mm. lot of concerns about, telling their own story. So this is huge. Yeah. Thank you so much. You know, I had a similar experience with um, speaking in tongues because I think the one thing that's unique about the revival centres is that particular doctrine that mm. you have to speak in tongues in order to be saved and go to heaven and be okay if Jesus came back because we, there was a lot of teaching about Jesus coming back for the second time and taking all the you know, saved people up to heaven. And I, I remember being taken into my Sunday school room and told to say hallelujah really fast. So hallelujah, 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 hallelujah yep. until I was basically stuttering. <laughs> yeah. And I was the same as you. I was scared that actually I wasn't doing it right or it hadn't mm. really happened. I felt nothing. But there was later times where I, you know, particularly in group settings when I was praying in tongues, I felt some kind of trance-like state almost or a meditative mm. state that I, you know, I don't believe that tongues is a language that we speak to God in or anything like that, but it, it's funny, these kind of group kind of meditation almost that happens when you're yep. just all doing the same thing, almost chanting together. Did you experience anything like that, despite the fact that you had doubts about tongues yeah. that were very valid? Yeah, absolutely. There were moments where you were, you know, pressing in, as they would say. I can't help but use all the jargon, by the way. <laughs> yeah, no, it's, a, it's our language. It's our cultural language. Yeah. You get slain in the spirit. See, I could never get slain in the spirit. It's well, we didn't get slain in the spirit in revival centres. You weren't no. allowed to fall over. That would be hysterical. Well, yeah, I mean, that's the funny thing, and it's it's that's why it's great having both of you here because I think you, you'd you understand the difference is that in the revival centre, Tanya, we, we really look down on the sort of very emotive charismatic side of the Pentecostal movement which mm. I would which I would put Hillsong in. I mean that was a very yeah. early on kind of thing. Well, yeah, yeah. I mean people were escorted out of meetings for dancing or putting their hands up in the air. Mm. In oh, center, so there was That's right. If someone put their hands in the air in a revival center, it would have been so awkward because it was like I think I mentioned this in the book. It's it's it, it's kind of like the ultimate symbol of the new wave pentecostal movement mm. and everything that the revival center was trying to separate itself from the slippery slope down to <laughs> yeah it's forbidden to feel any emotion about god for sure and I, I remember going to pentecostal churches after i left revival centers and just being amazed you know because the whole toronto blessing yeah was coming out at that time people were barking and making yeah. animal noises mm. in church mm. so it was quite an opposite extreme that yeah, you know, I struggled just to put my hands in the air for the first time. You would have really, I, I kind of really spell that out in the book when I go to the Christian City Church and check check that out after I leave the Revival Centre, that that feeling of almost looking over my shoulder in case a Revival Centre member is going to be <laughs> in there watching me lift my hands in the air, but the amazing feeling when I did. Yeah, it was just, I think that feeling was breaking out of the restrictions that we'd grown up in almost rather than a spiritual experience. It was yeah, just liberating for that reason rather yeah than and than and than i think in the revival centers we also didn't really believe that people in other pentecostal churches or even other christians were actually saved no See, and i keep i keep thinking of that i keep thinking about that because you guys were told that stadiums were going to be filled by you guys as well so there must be a lot of other kind of sects of Pentecostalism that were told all the same things. And so you're kind of keeping yeah. yourself pure for all these really good reasons that didn't happen. What's it like looking back 
now on that kind of all those hopes and dreams that you kind of had you know that well they look crazy they look they look absolutely bonkers and at the time this was our world as you've said and it felt so normal and made sense and we we're all on the page to get the same page together and that that was a nice feeling but the the more you step away from it it just looks so different and then you start feeling back you know the layers and you're like oh that's right they also t- told us about british israelism that was <laughs> that was actually crazy pyramidology that you know the uh, live on the americs was another one that yeah longfield well, used to love talking about and once you once you step back from it you're like oh my god this was bonkers <laughs> absolutely it's it's crazy well, what impact do you think, and I'm a bit off track here, but we, what impact do you think technology had for you in kind of, you know what I mean, get, gaining awareness? And we only had highlighted Bibles to kind of flick through and refer to a concordance or something. Like I'm 41, so I was just using email, you know, in, in later high school into uni. So not a, not a huge impact at my I mean like say so since Google and since all this Facebook and stuff and well, since, since then I've been able to learn a lot more but mm. that, you know much longer quite a while after I've left the church in the process of leaving um actually the only sort of resource that I sort of accessed through the internet that helped me understand it a bit more at the time was actually some of Troy's material there's a well-known blog Aimu I think it's called I might, I might have mispronounced that but there's a, a blog full of material that explains some of the problems with the revival centers and you know has a lot of original documentation mm-hmm. to to back up their their critique so i did in 2002 2003 you know act start as accessing some of that material but that was about it i mean I'm, i guess i'm asking because it just makes you wonder how now that people have access to all of this kind of information that those kinds of belief systems can still have such a hold, but they do. And, you know, can you speak to that at all? Like, how do you explain it? Which part of it do you mean? Well, you know, now that we've got access to how all this is, all this information, all this technology, mm. you can connect, you can seek help, you could do, you know, you could find out all yeah. the kind of information and yet people stay and they're still recruiting and it's growing. How do we explain this? Like, well, I, I think I think with all the connection we have to information now and our social networks, I think it it would have been harder to stay in the revival center. I think yeah, all that information does does change your worldview, oh. but at the same time, people are still joining sort of conspiracy style mm. groups of mm. of all kinds, and essentially that's what the revival center is. It's a religious conspiracy theory. It's a, oh. it's a theory that all the other churches have got it wrong and the culture culture of that group is not to trust anyone else because they're not part of god's chosen church yeah on on that because i remember when i left and i left um when the split happened between uh, team a and team b so the right time to leave yeah my mum said we probably should have left around the time of the split and you know what (laughs) i was 14 then that would have been almost perfect we had the beautiful childhood with lots of friends and a great sense of community but just heading into our teenage years where (laughs) yeah well i i was 18 so i was just starting university and going to that transition in my life as well a bit of background there was a bit of a, a split over a doctrine that came in that if you had sex before marriage you could you'd lose your salvation and be permanently banned from the church. There was a split right down the middle. So I went to team B at that time, which which was the, no, that that is false. We weren't allowed to read any material that wasn't published within the group. So that that access to information, yes, you could probably not control it as much when when it's the whole internet, but I hadn't read another Christian book until I was 18. So I'd been in the arrival centers 10 years before that happened. Yeah, and that's the same same for me in a sense. Like when I finally started reading mm. some um, other philosophy, like I mentioned Alan Watts in the mm-hmm. book The Wisdom of Insecurity, I realised, oh, I haven't been reading more broadly than the Bible or Revival Centre material for any kind of guidance or, or wisdom or explanation for why we're here or, or how to live. And, and where does that moment of courage come? Because that's a really big thing, not getting external literature mm. not trusting the media 
you know, yeah. and, and you know, the, the mistrust of science and critical thinking. Yeah. Where did you find that kind of mustard seed of faith to be able to start um, doing it? You know, I guess I was at the just at the end of my degree by then, but I was I was, you know, not not mm-hmm. studying. I was studying commerce. I wasn't particularly deep on you know any kind of mm-hmm. cultural analysis mm-hmm. or that that kind of critique. But that was again through that first big trip overseas where I met I met a Christian guy who recommended me that book, and you know, so it was getting outside my normal circles and and meeting other people that sort of through other influences and information in, in my lap. It's like a, something Amazing. something eventually splinters in your mind. I, and it's why I, re- I relate so much to that movie, The Matrix. It's just that splinter in the mind. There's something that keeps bothering you and eventually, eventually you can't live with that splinter anymore. Yep. And yet the outside world is so strange. Hey, I'm just wondering what that, that process looks like now over the 20 years it will take. Mm. In terms of, you know, how you've changed and how you kind of look at that and... Good question. I mean... Um, it, people are at so many different stages. Do you know what I mean? So we've yeah. got some people in, some people just left, some people yeah 20 well, years and it's they're just talking about it. Well, that's... that's I've been getting those kind of reactions from people as well. I've been getting people who are even still inside the revival centre saying, hey, thank you, this is helping me kind of work through my own questions. Yeah, wonderful. Um, I've got people who have just left. I've got people who left a long time ago but haven't been able to talk about it or haven't kind of crystallised what really happened for them. Mm -hmm. And I think I've been really lucky in the way I've been able to process it. It's just, it's just, I maybe, you know, I've got a supportive family eventually, even though we went through some really tough years there where we were on different pages with the whole thing. But I, I, I just needed to understand it. I'm one of those people that has to get into the, I have to, if I'm going to hold a belief and a and an idea, I have to understand what it is. So that's why I was questioning things. Whereas I I, I rang my my brother and we're only a year and a half apart. Um, after I'd got most of the book down in the first draft, I said, "Do you remember these moments?" And he remembered exactly the same moments. Mm-hmm. He goes, he goes, yeah, I remember that prayer meeting. All I remember thinking was. My brother's really angry with me, mm. but he he didn't doubt his experience in speaking in tongues at that point. He never questioned it, even though he was more rebellious. And we just had very different approaches. So I I had to kind of nut it all out, especially being the first one in the family to take that step out. I had to work through the belief. So I started up on the Bible, and then I started going to these other churches. So yeah, first I went to Christian City Church, Oxford Falls, Sydney, mm-hmm. and I went to the Monabau Christian Life Center for a while. And that's where I really was was very clearly and generously explained by the pastor there how how bonkers the revival centre doctrine was. But eventually, I also found things about that church that didn't sit well with me. Mm. And so, mm. eventually, I stepped outside of the Pentecostal world altogether. And once I did that, I realised that even though those other Pentecostal groups didn't see speaking in tongues as mandatory speaking in tongues and those other experiences like slaying in the spirit were still such an important part of what they were doing that Mm -hmm. if it wasn't happening for you, you felt like a lesser saint. Mm -hmm. And even though it was a softer version of the same narrative I'd been struggling with, it still felt the same. It still felt like I wasn't adequate, that God, you know, if he was real, wasn't giving me the full package. Mm. It's never ending, is it? It's just relentless. Eventually, you have you're so busy with all your time and activities caught mm-hmm. up with these churches that you have no relationships outside the group. Well, that's an, that's a very interesting point. So, in in Mudgee, in a country town, I did have a lot of great relationships outside. But when I became part of a bigger church, as you say, where more of your life is invested inside of it, mm-hmm. then that's that's actually was a big reason why I was like, this doesn't stack up. I don't want to live a life where all of my friends and all of my trust is bound up with people in one organisation. That does not feel like a good way to live. One thing Revival Centres does is excommunication. Yeah. yeah people are, are kicked out of the group if they, you know, I, I got kicked out a couple of times for drinking or smoking or I didn't get kicked out for sex before marriage. A few of my friends had to get kicked out for six months. Yeah, that's that's your whole social life killed overnight because you don't have that connection with people outside and if you are kicked out and start to make those relationships you're you're shamed about having close friendships outside the group when when that happened to you what sort of trauma did you go through yeah that experience 
Well, I was living in a share house with other Revival Centre young men. And so one really tough tension point was the house. And when I started to fall out with the oversight, the message comes through the house, oh, you're going to have to move out. I'm like, oh, man. I'm like, no, I don't. I, I got the lease of this house and the, and the boys who, and I didn't have any, a problem with any of the boys. They were, they were, they were good guys just trying to do the right thing as they'd been taught to do. And they said, well, look, if you, if you don't move out, they're going to make us move out. <laughs> so that was one Always of the, that bit of emotional blackmail to a go with everything. You know what I mean? Yeah, it was pretty, and stuff. Oh. that was heavy. So I did, I had to move out of my own house. So they were pretty dark times and I didn't have the support of my family at that point. And I had like a, a real physical, I, you know, write about this. I had a physical heartache. I had a soreness inside my chest. Mm-hmm. And, um, mm-hmm. I still believed in God at that point. And I was, I kept almost like a constant prayer. God, what, what have I done? Where have I gone wrong here that I have this feeling, this physical pain in my chest and what do i need to do to get back on the right path of my sort of the right destiny so i tr- i sort of tried to imagine these different pathways of choices i could make including from going back to the church to completely walking away what would what would give me a sense of calm what would take away this physical pain so i was racking my brain about what was the right thing to do and in hindsight and i guess back to your early question I, I have the luxury of being able to understand all this and see it now slightly detached from the emotional pain and can just sort of understand it for what it was. And I was just a very stressed, a stressed young, young man whose world was being ripped away from him yeah, with no, sen- no sense of control and no sense of where my future would go because all of the structures I've been brought up with were falling away now that I could see how faulty they were. So mm. that's what was going on for me. And it, it took me quite a few years to just build my confidence, Mm -hmm. you know, so I left 21 and yeah, it took me quite a few years and, you know, eventually I rebuilt, I spent a year overseas and kind of disconnected from everything, lived in Amsterdam for a while. And then I came back to Sydney and and it was sort of like starting my life again. I started making a lot of friends in and around the inner city and start eventually got my media career going and build a, build a world, you know, Built new new friendships that weren't founded on these institutions that could could one day be sort of disconnected from you. And you've been so successful, and it's so interesting because I mean Fiona has a, a number of projects that you know she one of the things she does is run. Where are you running the mark? Yeah, I run the Fitzroy. Fitzroy. I, I do run. Right, so as well. you know, she's um, media and event management stuff as well. These places produce a lot of high achievers and successful people as well. Have you have you observed that? Not. Yeah. You know? Yeah. One of the things I'm grateful for some of the skills I was learning, like I was running teams of forty people and preaching, and you know, in the revival centres they did huge musical productions. What, what other opportunity would a fourteen year old girl have to perform in a production where hundreds or thousands of people are coming and watching? Are you talking about Noah? No, I wasn't in Noah. I was I was in plays like Five to Go, and uh, some they were really high quality with lighting, yeah. sound, costumes, I, I, amazing stuff. I moved to Melbourne in two thousand for six months and was part of that whole thing. And yeah, we put on this epic musical in the in the young people's team I was a part of, and I was playing guitar, and it was it was amazing because they it wasn't kind of on a Hillsong production level, but it was you know much better than I'd grown up with. So. Yeah. Yeah. I wonder how much those kinds of, you know, being so disciplined and so priving yourself of things and having mm-hmm. to pray and read and study. And I wonder if that doesn't kind of rub off and give people success. Yeah. I think there's pros and cons. I think I think on the whole it's it's a negative, to be honest. It was in the Revival Centre. I, I think maybe in the bigger bigger churches where, where you do learn more skills because it's on a bigger scale and of, of a higher standard. But... It actually really dampened ambition, um, our church. That any okay. any kind of ambition you had for anything that was considered worldly was seen mm. as moving away from God. So you're explicitly told not to go for essentially kind of egotistical careers. So the career that I've ended up having, I wouldn't have been able to be a journalist. Mm. Yes, yeah, same. Center. 
So actually, I think mostly it's a negative thing, but some people have succeeded in spite of in spite of that upbringing. The main positive, I think, is that you got a very warm, loving, stable start to life, and I think that can do amazing things for people. I think yeah. you know, compared to the alternative, if you if you're in a really unstable, unsupported, or or lonely environment as a kid, you you could you could develop problems that would last your whole life. But I think you know. Yeah, you, you get through those early childhood years and maybe some of your teenage years with that that beautiful community. I think mm. I think that mm. offers something. A, a large social group that you know we weren't drinking together or doing anything like that, mm. hanging out in a wholesome kind of way. It was actually yeah. mm. that part of it was good until you hit your teenage years, I think. But one story in your book, Tom, that I literally cried, and I think I actually wouldn't have been able to read your book maybe ten years ago without it. Mm re-triggering trauma in fact some of the people you mentioned particularly from melbourne were friends of mine too so it was quite funny to read about what they did after i left the story about your dad just being stood down over the phone mm. after 17 years serving as a pastor in the church i thought that mm. was just cold yeah that was that was it's really uncommon it, it's, it's brutal gosh how did he recover from that yeah, that was a tough time for him. He was he was smashed by that. He'd given so much to the church, and you know he had been going against the grain for quite a few years. Um, he had a much more liberal view on things, and, and was trying to actively change the church, but from the inside and with the best of intentions. And they'd even moved all the way from Mudgee, New South Wales, to Adelaide to help take over what was left of the church there after the split. And it was a it was a very small. It was a bit of a sad little group. It was really struggling. And Dad had poured all this energy into trying to build people up and support them. And then he had that little flock taken away from him. And, yeah, it was it was really hard. And it was a big point of transition for the whole family. They do that to people. And they make it look like an accident or kind of disorganisation or doing that to people. In, in Hillsong, they take them to Maccas. So they go up Maccas and a meeting with the pastor. Oh, See you later. Funny. Yeah, there's a scene in Hungry Jacks in my book where we have a bit of a theological debate. Um, <laughs> a mutual environment, you know. Couldn't go to a pub, so that's probably the next closest thing, isn't it? Well, yeah, I mean, it's, a, it's like where you do your child custody hand over stuff, like it's all really cool. <laughs> there's such mafiose. I'm wondering because what I have noticed over the last even 12 months doing some of this is that people who come from uh, stronger family units yeah. are able to manage this better because they have mm. a comparison of to the dysfunction that they see. Yes. So things reach a certain point and they go, no, nah, that's not what love is. Yeah. You don't love me because I know what love is. Yeah, I think I think that's a big advantage I I had. We had yeah, a strong family. That's what comes through for you. So and yeah, good extended family as well. And by virtue of that, some some good friendships outside the church, which were a benchmark for me as well. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. I think that's a, a that's a very good observation, Tanya. Oh, it's it's just from this like raw data that basically has has come along. The the more predatory aspects of this movement prey on people who are under stress disadvantaged vulnerable what you know whatever yeah. they want to use or you know but the majority as you know the majority of people who are sitting on seats are good quote unquote you know, good people yeah. trying to do a good thing and trying to have a face it's not this great big church of scientology that people step into you know they often start out as these really small places and then yeah. i'm interested to hear from you guys about because i've what the other th funny thing about my journey is i i didn't talk about this much over the last 15 years mm. you know everyone who became a good friend of mine knew about the church but as you pointed out with that friend of mine who interviewed me for one of my online book events <laughs> i hadn't told them the detail and i mm. i thought my story was written all over my face i thought yep. Yep. i thought that when i told them a little bit they got the full picture Yes. But now it wasn't until I put it all in the book that I realised I almost hadn't told them anything. <laughs> and, and it's because people would say, okay, what happened to you? And you go, well, nothing. Like it, it, it would happen to me, say, with American journalists or producers would go like, what's this Hillsong thing about? Okay, so, you know, what, 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 where are the bodies in the basement basically? Yeah. Well, there aren't any. 
like it's a big deal and it's so hard to articulate which is why you're writing this book is just so important for so many people because we don't even have the language for a lot of our experiences yeah to be able to articulate it and and i think that's because we weren't allowed we weren't encouraged we were told what we were experiencing you know what it's like it's the book the the medium of the book is just such the right medium for this kind of issue because mm. it's not a sexy one liner it, it it it's actually like a social psychological story that requires so much context to properly understand yes where the pain is yes. and so my stories are fine you know but actually when you set it out you see that there really was some pain that 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 fear of social exclusion and and being thrown out of the world that you grew up in and that is actually a very harsh weapon it's like so, social exclusion is one of mm. the the worst psychological mm. weapons you can use on a, on a human being because we thrive on on connection and identity. identity. Yeah. 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 And, and our social connection, you know, links to other things like our livelihood, yeah, our purpose in life, our yeah. value system, you know, all and of that, those things. Yeah, and comparing a book to say conversations you have with friends, you're not gonna you're not gonna talk about it for an hour with someone. It's gonna bore the hell out of them. Yeah. <laughs> Yeah. When you set yeah. it out carefully, yeah. carefully in a book, it, it, it's much more compelling and you can get to the heart of it. So I think that's that's been the, the nice part of being able to get this down for me. And I, I didn't expect the, the reaction you guys are talking about. Like, I, I really didn't. And I, I, I guess I thought what? What do you mean? so many other people who've grown up in very similar ways and even, mm. even not so similar ways still, mm-hmm. saying, still reaching out saying, you know, someone from Jehovah's Witness in Peru Mm-hmm. Out, you know, saying yes. you you have told my story i'm like wow because i thought the revival centers was so different to those other groups but actually so many of you know despite that really unique theological position of the, the revival center actually a lot of the behaviors and the push and pull factors the tensions were were very similar well i feel like there's a part of my life that the new friends in my life and the new connections in my life, they just don't understand. So having other people that go, I I understand your experience is, mm. it's really liberating. And I think. Um, healing. Mm. Just, I just think particularly with this, because we've all been, you know, censored, silenced, shamed, separated, mm. isolated, you know, to be able to have those connections and for you to be able to, you know, even you, Tom, to be able to connect with someone in Peru and go, yeah, me too. Or, you know, mm. I know what you're saying. It's huge. It's got to be a, a huge feeling, right? Yeah. No, it's been a really a nice surprise of the whole thing. So you guys sound like you're in touch with a much wider network of of people who've been in the Pentecostal movement before. What what's what's out there? What have I been kind of inadvertently stepping into by coming yeah. out with the story? Well, I for a long time wanted nothing to do with anyone from the groups that I've grown up in. Um, Mm. and moved right away from it probably only been the last five years that I got back in touch and connected uh, that kind of thing but it's really been a recent thing for me reconnecting with the communities of people that have left and I think that's only recent that people have sort of started to form this way into groups Mm, on Facebook and you know because of the separation and the shame and the censorship and the fear I mean absolute terror that people have very genuine fear of being struck down with sickness if they speak out against God or the or Christ or the church or the body, you know, that they're going to get punished. It's such extreme trauma out there in different forms. Like, does your partner understand you a bit better now? And do you have different ideas about the father you're going to be now than you might have, say, five years ago? Oh, yeah. Firstly, definitely helps my partner understand it. She feels really sorry for, for me, actually, mm. which is a strange, yeah. strange thing. That's not really the sort of dynamic we normally mm. we normally have. But her reactions have been a she she heard the most of my drafts along the way when I wrote something that I thought was good. I'd read it out to her, and she's just like, "That is so crazy." And so that did help me get a sense of how how out there some of it was. So yeah, she she definitely understands me a lot better now. You know, all of my serious relationships, I've I've told them a lot about it. I've never, mm. never actively hidden it. It's just I got on mm. with it. Mm. But people knew that because I, I, I was sort of well known amongst my friends, you know, in the inner city of Sydney as being 
like a real party animal and really mm -hmm. extroverted, really energetic, mm -hmm. always wanting to be out, like a real social animal. Charismatic. Like, yeah, and people tied that to where I'd come from and that I was sort of, I was known for being a bit of a late bloomer. My, my wildest years were actually in my 30s. So there was always a sense of that's where I'd come from and it was a part of an explanation for my kind of exuberance. Delayed adolescence, I reckon. Yeah, a lot of that. A little uh, bit, but also just a lot of passion, you know. I was excited about life mm -hmm. and I knew where I stood and that filled that filled me with a lot of drive. Mm. And when I when I started, got my first job at Triple J and I was meeting people that I, I was impressed by and wanted to connect with, it was so exciting because... Mm. This was the life that I didn't even know I would get to have, but felt so right and mm -hmm. actually did feel like I'd found my destiny. And so I was charging through it and just having a, an absolutely amazing time. What was the second part of that question, Tanya? Well, just, Father, fatherhood. Yeah. yeah. It's just because, you. I mean, you have come from a happy, strong family, obviously with its ups and downs, but mm. I'm guessing you've got different values yeah. They're yeah. the one you came from. I, yeah. so what, I mean, we all have these ideals about the kind of parent we're going to be. That, yeah, oh, totally. That, and yeah. I'm, I'm, <laughs> I'm about, to, about to be tested. You know, our firstborn is just turn one. So mm. it's all theory right now. But like, I'd honestly move out for two years, but okay. <laughs> <laughs> so what I hated from my upbringing was being told what to do. Drove me crazy. Yeah. And it just, it doesn't, it doesn't work. It, mm -hmm. it annoys people and it disempowers them. And so theoretically, I plan to be a very liberal parent, but very supportive and take a lot of effort and energy to explain things and, and why why things are the way they are and, and why something might be a bad idea, what the consequences of it might be, rather than just shouting orders and expecting yeah. no authority to be yeah. enough. So I want to I raise a really well-informed questioning child that thinks about things rather than being dictated to so that might be hard and I'm I, I also am conscious that I might overcorrect you know my dad was very authoritative and mm -hmm. I don't want to be like that that's very honest of you it's yeah. um I mean because you know they, you're not describing a childhood of extreme abuse and neglect no. that this is a happy family well, however exactly. It also showed up what was really great about my parents that, yeah. the fact that we ended up on the same page and that actually yeah. the, the really great parts of their parenting. It, it actually made me realise when, as soon as Maxwell was born, I realised what my parents did so well, which was emotional connection and availability. Mm -hmm. And I, I looked at my little boy and I thought, all the other more complex things aside, I just have to be here for this child. Mm -hmm. That's the main thing I need to do. And by being here, I mean emotionally available and available with, with my time and attention. That will, that will be the first foundational thing. And my, my parents were, were great in that respect. Yeah, I have a five and a half year old. I feel so happy that he's going to grow up in an environment that's free of this stuff. Mm. Is there anything you miss even now from church or yeah. are you? Yeah. Definitely. What one thing really lately I've started to witnessing because when you've got a baby, it's so hard to just do things, get out, and especially mm. do social things. I, I actually miss having a weekly routine where I saw a lot of the people in my life. Mm. Like mm. as repetitive as and at times boring it was, compared to the way most secular people live. Like how mm. much work do you have to put into organising your social life? Like mm -hmm. to live a a, boy, a buoyant socially healthy life you have to make so many plans with friends and play dates and yeah. yeah and when there's kids involved and there's nap times to work around and all this stuff and babysitting like it's so hard to get together you know back in in the days where i was partying a lot more it was that was almost our social structure that from say thursday mm -hmm. friday sunday yes. night we'd be at the same pub or the same warehouse party or house party or you know on tuesdays there might be more of a, a chill dinner party vibe or out for dinner you know i, I kind of miss those times but so yeah i miss that i miss the community yeah the, the and, and it's a reliable community like those people are going to be there on sunday yeah doesn't matter what mood you're in they'll be there and they'll be there for you like yeah. seems only sport seems to bring people out yeah. without advertising and encouragement and that kind of thing it's the only other thing apart yeah. from you know the party lifestyle and stuff but. yeah well, when i was a strong 
believer i loved sport but i i thought it was sad that that was about all australian society had they don't have any true meaning nothing nothing of any depth brings them together they they rally around sport like it's a religion but it's it's not but now here i am thinking actually that's great something that brings people together in a healthy positive way fantastic it doesn't need a deeper theology to be of great value to to individuals and society gets them out of the house yeah, yeah. Gets you together, you know? Yeah, <laughs> community. Um, well, that's why there, there are atheist churches that have started up for the same reason. Is that, yeah, but they don't, I mean, they don't really seem to. They don't seem yeah. to have much traction. At, I mean, there's no fear factor behind there that if I don't go there, the flames of hell are going to bite at my feet. <laughs> it's sad. It's kind of, I miss it's, all those old days as well where we're all just going to be there and kind of have this, you know, we all knew what the standards were. What was expected of us? Did you find it difficult to socially adapt, like in, I don't know, in workplaces or anywhere like that? I, you know. Yeah, uh, I did. I went did. to a mainstream school because the kids at Christian schools find it even harder. But Oh, yeah. I mean, I, I, I felt like a real outsider trying to crack the kind of inner city culture in mm. Sydney. I didn't understand the kinds of conversations, the kind of, you know, social theatre that was going on, the sense of humour, what, what, was in our cultural world and what wasn't and, and what, what we were really talking about or what we were really there for or what was really mm. binding a group of people. I, I was like, why, why are all these people friends? Am I, am I, what is this tribe? Am I part of this or mm. not? You and know? how do you know? Yeah, so I really struggled. <laughs> it's like, am I missing something? What, what, what brings us here? Is it the love of alcohol? Like what, what, what connects us? And so... Yeah, for a long time, I, I really did struggle to find my place. I found it in my early 30s. I found people that I understood and loved hanging out with and felt comfortable around and felt like I, I kind of finally landed in that social sense. So, yes, it took ages. It took 10 years. Mm. Mm. I mm. landed in a new network of friends pretty quickly. And I think that's a real key to le to leaving is yeah. and, and doing it well is to have something that you go to um is there any advice you would give to people leaving these groups oh wow well I've, yeah i've been careful not to prescribe my experience to other people and i've put my story out in graphic detail mm -hmm. <laughs> but without kind of saying anything about what other people should do i guess some general things is is like try and build the support around you from trusted neutral kind of people and that there might be actually mm. people in your life who you haven't thought of that might be able to play that role like mm. you know if you were brought up in it your your aunties and uncles who aren't in the church who know you since birth people like that can be mm. a really good a good sounding board and in, in life and they've probably been biting their tongue over the years about yes the church that their sibling got caught up in but you know those kinds of people who can offer or family friends outside the church mm. like i think I think building that social support is is really important because that'll be that'll be a bridge and a comfort for you as you sort of. I, I had literally one friend outside. Was well, this when I left the AOG? But mm -hmm. but they saved completely saved me. They were invited me to parties. Yeah. They you know connected me with their friends. If they were going out for a beer, they'd shoot me a text. Yeah, that's nice. And I suddenly had a whole network of new friends that. I think the trauma of what of losing everything in one go was lessened a lot by just yeah. having that one person. The other bit of advice I give again, it's very just general and not try not to be over prescriptive is to mm -hmm. is to go easy on yourself. Be nice to yourself. Don't yes. don't 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 expect too much of yourself. Don't expect to feel normal and centered straight away. Yeah. I think, you know, my story shows that it takes years to land and rattle through all these things you know i i didn't as i write i didn't have sex until two years after leaving because i was still just very slowly working through what what i was going to feel comfortable with so and that's about all that trust in your own actual like in your own feelings yes, and self confidence we're taught so much to deny our feelings and you know put all the trust in the words and the, mm. and the doctrine and stuff like that so you know, learning to uh, believe in your own, I don't want to sound like Meghan Markle, but your own truth, you know, learning to... Believe in yourself. And yes. It, I hesitate to say that sometimes as well because it sounds so 
wishy-washy, but that's part of the way we were brought up to see that kind of stuff as, as useless and, and then, mm. yeah, trusting, trusting God was the way to go. To sinner. Um, um, you know, I, be, lean not on your own understanding. That's um, right. That takes a long time to, to sort of break down, doesn't it? Yeah. Tom, it's been really great chatting to you. I've really enjoyed um, it. Yeah, well, I was interested to hear that you had a lot of people reaching out to you. I'm kind of I'm interested to know about that that reaction from people and yeah, what they're thinking. Well, it was it was often people that weren't involved in the groups, just right. that knew that I was that were, right. and some that were. Thank you so much for spending this time with us and being so honest and open and and you know we just wanted to let you know there's so many more people that you're influencing and affecting and helping than you probably ever know because of the nature of this thing. So thank you so much, Tom. Oh, thank you. I mean, that just leads me to one other question. I know you've, you know, you've obviously written your, your book about this, but if, if the way people are responding to me, it's like no one's ever written a book about leaving Pentecostalism before. What's the, what's the reality here? Have, Nobody's, nobody's really written a book about leaving Pentecostalism. So people say to me, wow, you wrote the first book, of, you know, about Hillsong. And I go, sweet, like, where's the second one? Right. It's your, it's the Revival Center thing. And I mean, it, that's quite specific in itself. And you know what I mean? Like medicinal in itself to those people specifically. Not Australia, I don't think. Yeah. There's yeah. just, you know, there's, not, and I'll put it to you this way. So my publisher used to say to me, we can't publish this book in the States. If you'd written a pro Hillsong book, we could publish it tomorrow. Nobody wants to put their name to something. And so I might actually ask you, like, at what point did you decide this is so important that I'm going to stand up and put my name to this? It doesn't matter how weird my friends actually end up looking at me. Was there, like, that kind of moment where you went, no, I've got to do something or say something. No, it wasn't like I didn't write it for that reason. Like I didn't write it thinking, oh, I want to help all those other people who've gone through the same thing. I just, I just thought it was an interesting story that mm. people didn't know much about, and a and a way of seeing the world and a, and a journey as an individual to go on that I thought people would find interesting. And I, I also wanted to get it down before I forgot about it all. Like you see, I had like this pretty deep recall on on all those experiences because they meant so much. It came all flooding back. And mm. I, interesting process, isn't it? When you start uh, really like really looking down memory lane and at all the little steps on the way and stuff. Yeah. I just had that story inside of me and I, I wanted to see if it would make a good book. And I just think people would find it interesting. I wasn't trying to make a really strong political or religious statement with it. Great speaking to you, Tanya and Fiona. It's it's such an interesting experience for me stepping into a conversation where Good. people really understand it. So I, I, yeah, I love I love these chats. I mean, this is one of the very few <laughs> I've had like this. That's wonderful. We're a funny little motley little crew, but we're so glad you're here. Thank you. Nice well. to meet you, Fiona. Yeah, thanks so much, Tom. I've really enjoyed our chat. No worries. Awesome. Right. Thank you. See ya. Bye. We'll talk soon. I hope. Sweet. See ya. There. Well, that was a really interesting conversation. Thanks so much to Tom and Fiona. We've got a giveaway of two books from Leaving Hillsong. Please see Facebook or Instagram for details there. Free stuff. Giveaways. We're in the big time soon. And I'm in talks for more books, you know, more giveaways for our listeners and especially the Kingdom Builders over at Patreon. So make sure you sign up there to get all the like special deals and stuff and, you know, be in the inner circle. We got loads more people with loads more things to say. So stay tuned. Keep up the messages, please. They mean everything. The feedback, the subscriptions, likes, follows, shares. Let us know what you want to hear about. And in the meantime, make sure you keep being kind to yourself and to other people while you keep leaving Hillsong. And we'll talk soon. Bye.